Thank you. Yeah, it is a Swiss name. It is Jaroslin. You're absolutely yeah, I, right. I, I, I so <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Good. <laughs> thanks for the introduction. Uh, yes, what I'm going to talk about today, the first thing I'm going to mention is that it's Josie Benfato and Giovanni Galavotti. They're both, both in Rome, both retired now, I think, but they're still hanging around there. Uh, the result, if you're interested in details and, and nice plots and so forth, there are preprints on the archive that are here. Of course, I don't expect you to remember the numbers of these preprints, so I put everything on my website here. I do expect you to remember the name of the website. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about the condo model, which is a, a model for something that uh, physicists are interested in. And so I'm going to first introduce what the condo model is, and then try to explain to you a little bit why I care. So the condo model. The condo model was introduced, well, it was first introdu introduced by Phil Anderson in 1961. Phil Anderson is the, at the University of Princeton here, right next door. Uh, but it was really studied in this context by Yun Kondo in 1964. What it's, what it's meant to model is a conductor. So imagine that you have a wire, let's say a copper wire. Okay? You want to understand the conducting properties of this copper wire. And in particular, in this case, you want to understand the effect of having impurities in your copper wire. So you're, you're never going to have a, an absolutely pure copper wire on you. It's just not going to happen. There's always some little weird things that are going to happen. So for instance, imagine that you have a copper wire that has an iron impurity inside your copper wire. And you want to understand how the iron impurity is going to affect the, the electronic properties of your wire. And so this is a model that was introduced to, to deal with this. So pictorially, the model is drawn down here. What it is, it's, as I, I promised, a wire. This wire is, a, is a, a sequence of sites. These sites you can think of as atoms. To my wire, I add an impurity, which is drawn here as a, as a little x. And that's, uh, you can think of as, as an iron atom that's coming and ruining things for the electrons that are down here. OK? So let's look at the, the model in a little more detail. So the way that I'm going to specify this model is by giving you the Hamiltonian of the model. The Hamiltonian is something that Sirwin mentioned yesterday. It's, you can think of this as the energy. If you're used to classical mechanics, you know, probably all seeing classical mechanics at some point in your life. This is the energy, right? So this is telling you how your electrons behave, how, you know, how, they, how they hop around on, this, on this, uh, this lattice here and how they interact with the, with the impurity. Now my Hamiltonian, the important thing that you have to keep in mind is that it's going to be the sum of two terms, an h0 and the v. The h0 is the kinetic term of the electrons. The h0 tells you how the electrons hop around on the lattice down here. Now, it's defined formally over here. For those who know what all of these things are, this is a discrete Laplacian. This is an annihilation operator for, a, for an electron. If you don't know what these things are, you can simply think of this Hamiltonian here as an operator that propagates electrons. So it takes an electron on this side here and throws it on this side or throws it on that side. <coughs> okay? Purely one dimensional. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of, of a wire as ideal as I can think of a wire. So one dimensional, one dimensional problem. OK, so this is the kinetic term of the electrons. This is telling you how the electrons are hopping, and they're hopping from one side to the next. Next, I have this V. This V is the interaction of the electrons with the impurity. OK, this is going to be a magnetic interaction. So let me tell you a little bit what I mean by a magnetic interaction. Uh, some of you may know that electrons have something called spin. What spin is, in this context, you can think of it as a property. So you can think of your little electrons as magnets, magnets that can either be pointing up or pointing down. Okay? Now my impurity, it's iron. Iron is also magnetic. And so you can think of my, my little iron impurity as another magnet. And this interaction, what that, this is saying is that when you have an electron here that's pointing up or down, it's going to interact with my impurity that's pointing up or down. Now I have a parameter here, lambda 0. If lambda 0 is positive, then the interaction is ferromagnetic, which means that the magnets, they want to align. Essentially, I'm introducing a force that's telling my magnets that they want to be, in the, they, they want to be aligned. If lambda 0 is negative, then the interaction is anti-ferromagnetic, which means that my interaction is pushing my magnets to be anti-aligned. 
Okay, so this is the model. Are there any questions on the model so far? One impurity, exactly one impurity. So it's an extremely simplified model, but you already see non-trivial things in this uh, setting. Any more questions? If there's a, like, two dimensional vector space at each site, is that, or even bigger than that? Uh, it's, it's slightly bigger because there's spin, so you can have, so at each site you can either have an electron with spin up, have an electron with spin down, have both, or have nothing, so it's four dimensional. Uh, so I'll make it length L, and I'll sell L, send L to infinity. So yes. And what's the sigma for L? Uh, this one here, that's yeah. a Pauli matrix. So this would be the spin operator for an electron on site zero. This is, this is another, this is also a Pauli matrix. This is my, my, my spin operator for my impurity. My impurity is thought, as, thought of as being a, just a two-state system. It's not a Fermi, and it's not. OK? OK, so this is the model. That's the condo model. Now, the effect that I'm interested in is the condo effect. So far, no, no surprises. What is this, uh, this condo effect? So let's, let's go through these things slowly. First of all, it, it's, it's about the magnetic susceptibility of the impurity. So let me tell you, I'm not going to define the magnetic susceptibility formally. But the only thing I'm going to say about it is that it measures how much the impurity is susceptible to an external magnetic field. So if I turn on an, ex an external magnetic field, you know, think, of a, think of a compass. If you have an external magnetic field and your compass is a, it's a little magnet, it's going to align with the magnetic field. So I'm asking essentially the same question. I'm turning on a magnetic field on my impurity, and I want to know whether the spin of my impurity is going to align with the magnetic field for small magnetic fields. OK? Formally, this means adding a term to the the, ha the, elect the magnetic field is going to be a, a term that's added to the Hamiltonian. And if I want to define this formally, I look at the response, that is the magnetization of, uh, of the impurity, and derive it with respect to the field. OK, so that's uh, the magnetic susceptibility. The higher the, the susceptibility, the, the more the impurity is going to try to align with the magnetic field. OK? OK. So the first thing that is important to know about this system is that, let me go back to the model, if I turn off v, so if I set lambda 0 to 0, then I know how to do everything. Everything is simple. If I don't have v, then everything is totally integrable. And I can tell you exactly what the, the magnetic susceptibility of my impurity is. It's this quantity that I wrote here. I can compute it explicitly. And if I take the temperature to 0, so the temperature is a quantity that it's kind of it's like jiggling my system. It's putting random events in my system. If I send the temperature to zero, then the magnetic impurity of my uh, the magnetic susceptibility of my impurity is going to go to infinity. What that means is that if I put a tiny little magnetic field, my impurity is going to align with the magnetic field, however small the magnetic field is. Okay. Now, if I do the same thing with my chain of electrons, I have impurity and a chain of electrons. So I look at the magnetic susceptibility of a single site of my chain of electrons. I can still solve this. This is still a simple problem to find is that if I, once again, I take the temperature to 0, the magnetic susceptibility remains finite. It doesn't go to infinity. What this means is that if I have an electron on some site and I turn on a magnetic field, if the magnetic field is too small, then it's not going to align with the magnetic field. Okay? So I have an impurity that's very susceptible to an external magnetic field. And I have, a, 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 I have electrodes that live on different sites that are less susceptible to my magnetic field. Now, I turn on the interaction. I'm turning on the interaction between a susceptible system and a less susceptible system. And my question is, well, what's, what happens? Is the impurity still infinitely susceptible, or is it not? And the Kondo effect says that if the interaction, lambda 0, is negative, it can be arbitrarily close to 0. But as long as it's negative, then the magnetic susceptibility of the impurity in the interacting case is finite in the zero temperature limit. OK? So this is what I call a strong coupling effect. So what, what do I mean by a strong coupling effect? Well, by turning on an interaction, even an extremely small interaction, I'm changing the qualitative properties of my system. I'm going from a situation in which my impurity 
is infinitely susceptible at zero temperature to a situation where it's finitely susceptible at, a zero, at zero temperature. And I, do th and I get this for any value of the, of the interaction, provided it's negative. It could be minus 10 to the minus 31. Wouldn't matter. It, 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 no, not on. The, so I'm I'm looking at uh, so the the the, 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 the this is just a, I'm looking at the limit. Yeah, it will depend on on the interaction though. It'll get bigger. And I have to make temperature go to zero for all these effects. Or what happens with at, at finite temperature, nothing diverges, so you wouldn't have that sort of phase transition. Okay. All right. So let me tell you about. What was known? So this model I, I mentioned was introduced by Kondo in 1964. He, the computations that he did were a so-called uh, a Born approximation, which so the, the computation were quite enlightening. Unfortunately, they're not rigorous. Um, so this is you know why there there was still work to do after Kondo. This problem was also addressed by Phil Anderson in 1970, and later by Ken Wilson, later and more fully by. Ken Wilson. It's not. I'm assuming it's not the same Wilson as the previous talk. <laughs> I'm guessing the previous Wilson was David Wilson. Is that uh, okay? Anyways, this is Ken Wilson, um, right? And they developed a renormalization group approach to 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 look at this. I'm not going to go into the details of what a renormalization group approach is in this case. The only thing that I'm going to say is that the the approach that they developed here. Is based on perturbation theory. So you're you perturb in V. Exactly. So the self is what? It's, it's, it's the cubic term in lambda, in lambda zero. Exactly. OK, uh, one more thing, and this is, is also extremely important. In 1980, Nathan Andre, who's a, a physicist in Rutgers, about um, 20 minutes, half hour from here, depending on how much you speed. Um, he proved that the condo model, or at least a variant of the condo model, so uh, there's um, he so there, there's an operation that's done on the model that he introduced. It's not exactly the same model. You can exactly solve that using a technique called the beta ansatz. Now this is a, a fantastic result, and we're all very happy that it exists. Unfortunately, the beta ansatz it's it's fragile. As soon as you change something in the model, the beta ansatz no longer works. You know this is this is an exactly solvable model. As, long, as soon as you change the, the model a little bit, it stops being exactly solvable, as this tends to happen. And also, it requires this linearization, which physically doesn't seem like it, it should be a, a necessary condition. And so this was, was what, uh, what pushed us to try and address the problem. And what we did was to try and look and revisit this renormalization group approach. Oh, I didn't mention that these two works are not rigorous either. They're at the level of perturbation theory. And uh, our question was to see whether we knew how to say something rigorous about the renormalization group approach to the condo effect, which uh, I guess I'll come back later to, to the advantages of, of such an approach. So what kind of results do we have? I would like to be standing here and tell you that we solved the condo effect, the condo, condo model using renormalization group. We're not there. We're not there yet. We don't. We're not totally sure that we'll ever be there, but we have, we have um, a partial result. The partial result is that we introduced a hierarchical version of the condo model. I'm not going to go into the details of how that's defined, because that's, it gets tactical. It's not difficult, but you, know, you have to sit down and look at, look at the definitions. Essentially, we're taking the model. We're looking at certain properties of the condo model, scaling properties of the condo model, and we reproduce them in a simpler model that we know how to, how to deal with. The, the fundamental point of this hierarchical model is that from a renormalization group perspective, it's exactly solvable. What do I mean by exactly solvable from a renormalization group perspective? I mean that in the hierarchical the, we can reduce the hierarchical model rigorously to iterating a discrete two-dimensional dynamical system. To those, for those of you who have heard of renormalization group, what I'm, the, what I'm saying is that the beta function has two running coupling constants and only two running coupling constants, and that the beta function is explicit. So essentially, we have this, this special model, this hierarchical model, that we know how to, and we know how to map this model to a discrete two-dimensional dynamical system that's totally explicit. And within this uh, 
within this context, we know how to prove we can prove the the condo effect. So this is this is the susceptibility as a function of the temperature, as of the inverse temperature beta, and we see that it in fact does not diverge. So let me conclude with uh, what's left to do. So the the why is this interesting? Well, the usual approach to the renormalization group is a perturbative approach. We perturb in the interaction. Now, as I said in the beginning, our interaction is having a qualitative effect. It's qualitatively changing the behavior of the system. So perturbing around the non-interacting model doesn't seem like the right approach. Instead, what we have here, we have, we have a hierarchical model that has the right qualitative behavior. It has the qualitative behavior of the full model, of the interacting model. But we still know how to solve that. And so the question is, can we perturb that? Can we perturb the hierarchical model? If we can't perturb that hierarchical model, can we define another hierarchical model which we can perturb? And so that's, that's the kind of stuff. Uh, one, fi one final word is uh, that why, why would this be important? Well, why do I, I care about renormalization group for strongly coupled effects? Well, strongly coupled effects, they exist everywhere. Their physics is full of strongly coupled effects. I can name the, the, probably the most important one in, in my mind would be superconductivity, which is this wonderful effect where you have this conductor that doesn't have any resistance. You can run any current through it. It's not going to waste any energy. And we would like to understand how that works. And this is still a, one of the major open problems of, uh, of uh, modern mathematical physics. <coughs> and uh, if we had a, a renormalization group approach to this that worked for strongly coupled effect, this might be a road to, to understanding that. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you.